Hi, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here to talk about St. Alden's Hospital Archive. Um, this was the first collection I catalogued when I started in the college, so it was also the first collection I catalogued as a professional archivist, so I have a big soft spot for this collection. Um, I'm just going to very briefly tell you a little bit about what's in the collection, and I think you'll see as we have the rest of the talks today that a lot of the researchers have drawn on this material and how valuable it is. So the hospital opened in 1919, so we're celebrating the centenary this year. I've got the closing date as 1986, but I'm going to bow to Hillary's superior knowledge and say it was probably 1984. <laughs> um, the archive was transferred to the college in 1989, so it took a little bit of a while after the hospital closed for it to be moved here. And it was largely as a result of the work of Dr. Barbara Stokes, who we're going to hear about later, who, who had the archive transferred here for safekeeping. As a result of the archive of St. Alton's coming here in 1997, uh, Kathleen Lynn's um, family donated her diaries to the college because they wanted the diaries to be kept with the archive of the hospital that she'd founded. And the two collections, the hospital and the Lynn diaries, are the most used collection in the archives. There's, there's so much in them. They cover so many areas of interest. Um, although the material has been here for quite a while, it wasn't catalogued, as I say, until I started in 2010. Although we, some researchers were able to use it before it was catalogued, it's obviously a lot easier now that we have it catalogued and we know what there is. So this is just a quick overview of what's in the collection. There's a full set of the hospital annual reports. There's also the reports of the National BCG Committee, which was founded at the hospital. I know Anne will be telling us more about that later. There's board and committee minutes and agenda books. There's a lot of papers about the proposed amalgamation with the National Children's Hospital. Interesting, the hospital did quite a lot for their Golden Jubilee 50 years ago, so there's quite a lot of material relating from that time. There's the Archivist Friends' other administrative papers, where I've hidden everything else that I didn't know where to put it. Uh, there's publicity and fundraising material. There are some fantastic photographs. And then there's also some artifacts and commemorative plaques that were in the hospital and came here as part of the collection. So the annual reports, as I say, there's a full set from 1919 right through until it closed. Um, they're very formulaic in the information that's in them. It lists all the, the staff. It lists the incomes and outgoings. There's details, numerical details of patients treated and things like that. There's always calls for help to finance the hospital. In the early reports, there's knitting patterns so that you could knit um, jackets and booties for the babies. Um, I really like the kind of change in style over time that you get in the front covers um, of the reports. I say we also have the reports of the National BCG Committee, which I haven't really gone into because I think Anne's going to be touching on that later. We have the board and committee minutes. There's a full set of ha hospital board minutes from 1918 when they start planning the hospital through to 1984. This is the front cover of the first minute book, which I really love. Someone has put the sticker on saying first minute book important. So they were already aware of this. <laughs> Um, the early minute books are meticulously written, I think, in the hand of Madeleine French Mullen, who Sylvia is going to talk to us about, who did a huge amount for the administrative sort of side of the hospital. The medical committee is also really well covered with an almost complete run of minute books from 1919 to 1982. The House and Finance Committee, um, a bit later, the surviving books from 1944 to 83. The Hospital Utility Society, this was a society that was set up in the 1930s to provide social housing. So the Dublin Corporation had a scheme to encourage other bodies to build social housing. St. Alden's Hospital took the opportunity, the Utility Society founded and built a series of blocks of flats um, opposite the hospital. The fa Madeline Frenchman and flats, I think, were knocked down a couple of years ago, but they were there until quite recently. The hospital set up a memorial committee after Dr. Kathleen Lynn's death to look at how they would honour her memory. That lasted for nearly 10 years, so there was quite a lot of work in that. And then we have one minute book from the nursing committee from towards the end of the time of the hospital. I, I just don't know. There must have been other ones, but they unfortunately haven't survived. Um, the amalgamation with the National Children's Hospital, uh, this is the part of the archive that's probably used most. Um, it was a big thing for the hospital. Lynn and the other doctors were really driving this amalgamation. Michael Scott, who's the, ar the architect the hospital used, drew up the plans. It was going to be along the canal, not far from where St. Alton's is. They were constantly pu publishing these flyers for decades afterwards, still waiting for their dream hospital. Um, the item which Hillary talked about that's used most is, this is a type script of the letter from Archbishop Byrne to St. Alton's Hospital explaining why he would not support the amalgamation. Um, as Hillary has touched on, it talks about he saw it. Although Lynn and others argued that they were not a Protestant hospital, they, were, they had doctors from both Protestant and Catholic doctors, it was seen as a Protestant hospital because they weren't all Catholic. Um, the Archbishop was afraid that they were going to teach um, Protestant 
morals to the children. He was worried that they were going to intentionally sterilize Catholic children in the hospital. I mean, it's an outrageous letter. The things he's saying are incredible. The hospital write back, countering every argument very clearly and explaining why this isn't the case. But as Hillary has shown us, it went nowhere and the amalgamation didn't take place. The Golden Jubilee, so uh, 50 years ago, the hospital were celebrating their Golden Jubilee. Sorry, this isn't a very good photograph. Um, they did quite a lot of research at the time into the early years of their hospital um, and sort of collected early stories. So there's a really lovely story of the very first matron. Um, Lynn was very keen that they would have fresh milk for the children, and they were given two goats, one by um, Edward Carson, which they called Carson. Um, and the goats were the bane of the matron's life. Um, <laughs> they caused her no end of problems. There's constant fights between her and the goats about whether the thing, and then also whether this milk was actually provided to the children, whether they actually provided any milk at all or just ate everything that they could. But it seems the, the goats seem to have been a really big problem early on. Um, it's really nice because it gives you an idea of some of the individuals. There's sort of recollections of staff who'd worked there for a really long time, talking about how the hospital was first set up. It was initially set up with just two beds, and you know how it had grown and developed. So that it's a, it's nice to have that kind of, I guess, personal recollections of the hospital in there. And um, the other admin papers, as I say, I've slightly sort of hidden everything else that I didn't quite know what to do with. There's a very small amount of correspondence. Uh, there's one visitors book, which is just people visiting the hospital. There's a rules for probationers, um, a menu book. There's a picture of it here, so you can see what the patients were served for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. Um, there's a postage book, so the records of the letters that they were sending out. And then there's also a series of um, architectural drawings for the new TB unit that was opened, I think, in the 50s in the hospital. And the hospital was, they were self-funded. They were always trying to raise money, and there was quite a lot of publicity. And there's two um, scrapbooks in which they've kept newspaper cuttings, flyers, anything about the history of the hospital. As you can see, a lot of them are asking for money, that there's how many children they can treat, how many they could treat if they had more money. They ran fundraising events, so they had Cayleys, they had um, concerts, newspaper cuttings about the hospital, things that were happening in there, and there's a, there's a huge amount of information in that material. There's some beautiful photographs as well. I expect some will be coming up in the talks later on, so I've actually picked some of the ones that I don't think will be featuring. Um, Catherine, there's photographs of nearly all of the founding staffs of, staff of the hospitals. This is Catherine Maguire. There's a photograph on the other side of the lunch group from the hospital. I think it's in the 1930s. Uh, again, you can see the predominantly female staff um, in the hospital. These photographs are from the annual report of the hospital and the annual report of the BCG committee, and it's nurses in St. Orson's getting their BCG jabs as a publicity thing to encourage other people to get them. And then on this side, Kathleen Lynn receiving new equipment from the uh, Rathmines Red Cross, Junior Red Cross Society, who did, had done fundraising drives for the hospitals in the late 40s. This is perhaps the most unusual set of photographs. There's two photograph albums like this. They're from the very early years of the hospital. They cover about 1919 to 1925, and they show the patients in the hospital. Um, they're meticulously labeled. Every patient is named in the photographs. None of the staff are named. <laughs> it's really interesting what they thought was sort of important. You can also see in the top, there's a group photo. The hospital held a kind of annual events every year where they invited all their previous patients to come back. And the hospital, they like to keep track of them and, you know, how they were getting on afterwards. So there's some, the, the photograph album is it's, it's really lovely, really touching. And they quite often do kind of admission photographs and discharge photographs, particularly of the early years. And you can really see that the patient's coming in really badly malnourished, and then they're going out as these very fat, happy babies. So there's the kind of some really nice stories, I guess, in the photographs. Um, the artifacts and plaques, the portrait of Kathleen Lynn, as um, Professor Horgan mentioned at the beginning, the, currently the only female on the walls of this building. Um, I didn't realize until I did research into this talk, the college actually purchased the portrait. It wasn't given with the hospital papers. The hospital offered it to the college before it went to auction, but it was the college bought it rather than it was given to them as part of the collection. There are some things that you would expect. So these are nurses' badges from the hospitals. Uh, there's also a shell case. So this is from one of the bullets that was fired over Kathleen Lynn's grave at her funeral because she was given a military funeral for her part in 1916. And someone from the hospital kept one of the bullet cases, and it's part of the archive. Um, the uh, Countess Markovic was a big supporter of St. Dalton's. She had links with Lynn and a lot of the founders. This is a tray that Markovic is supposed to have uh, carved. It was given to the hospital in the 1930s by the then Lord Mayor of Dublin. The chair, again, is supposed to have been upholstered by Countess Markovic, and it was again in the hospital, and it came to the college when the hospital closed. 
And there's also a series of these kind of brass, brass plaques that were around the hospital commemorating various things, either funding given to the hospital or, in this case, the award that was erected in memory of Kathleen Lynn. So what isn't in the archive? Uh, the patients. We have no patient records. I don't know what happened to the patient records when the hospital closed. No researcher has ever been able to track down what happened to the patient records when the hospital closed. If anybody knows, I would love to know. Um, so we don't have the names of the patients. We have the rough numbers from the annual reports. Of course, we do have the photographs I mentioned. These are some more photographs that were published in the annual reports, and you can see they're kind of doing before and after shots of the babies as they come in. There was one of their early um, patients who went on to be an award-winning Irish dancer. He's featured quite heavily in a lot of the annual reports, that they're sort of showing the success of their work in the future lives of their patients, but the, 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 we just don't know where the patient records are. The nurses are also pretty much underrepresented. There's this one photograph of nurses, again, with no names, so I don't know who they are. We only have the one nursing committee minute book. There's no records of the nurses, their training, anything. Again, I don't know what happened to them when the hospital closed. Was it because it was the medical side who were transferring the stuff that the nursing stuff didn't get moved? Did it go somewhere else? Again, we just don't know. If anyone knows where it is, always willing to know. Um, the artwork, I mentioned the portrait of Kathleen Lynn. The hospital also had several other pieces of art, including two John Butler Yeats sketches of Madeleine French Mullen and a full-length portrait of Countess Markovitch, although these were offered to the college. Um, unfortunately, the college decided they didn't want to buy them, um, and they went to auction through Adams, and I don't know where they are now. Um, again, anyone has any ideas? Um, <laughs> love to know. Um, we've, for the Mark the Centenary, um, Claire O'Neillon, who was working with me earlier in the year, did a, an online exhibition about the history of the early years of St. Dalton's Hospital, pulling on a lot of the artefacts um, from the archive. Um, it's available if you go to the RCPI Heritage Centre website. You'll see a link through from there. So it's a chance to look at some of these objects in more detail and just find out a bit about the history. Thank you. Yep. <laughs>